biomass, and, and, and Luca was right in the, the throes of actually saying what makes sense economically and what doesn't. And his, his chemical engineering training will become clear to all of you uh, very quickly. He got his degree in chemical engineering from the University of Padua, and he did his PhD uh, at Imperial College, and then went on to shell research in the Netherlands uh, before joining Cargill. With his, but I think you were briefly at Cray, at Cray doing yeah. computational work at Cray. Since leaving Cargill, he's gone off onto his own uh, uh, consulting work in a variety of different areas related to biofuels. And, and again, he's focused on trying to find real uh, places where using biomass as a feedstock makes economic sense. And today he's going to tell us about uh, whether or not it makes any economic sense to make fuels from uh, these renewable resources. Yeah, so welcome. Th thank you. And uh, have the speaker on? OK. So well, thank you for. Uh, uh, for invite here, it was always uh, a pleasure coming from uh, uh, from the frozen tundra to Santa Barbara. Although actually it wasn't that cold, you know, it was actually the same temperature today. <laughs> so, but uh, so here the title is slightly different from what I put in uh, in the uh, in uh, in the abstract. Uh, you know, promised land of my of marriage, and the thing is that you know they both involve a lengthy walk in the desert, and you don't know until you are there whether you are there or not. Uh, Eric introduced about me, and uh, you know, I, uh, as I said, uh, right now I am in the wilderness of startup. I have a picture there with uh, a very. Exp I got the fortune once to get uh, to have be given a, a ride in a P51 Mustang by the owner. Is actually the guy that built most ethanol plant in the, in the United States, and I put it there because uh, uh, you know I I'm very passionate about fuel. I like I like transportation. Uh, and uh, so I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not, at, I'm not at all a triager. I mean, so I'm, we, I have, you know, I have my guilty pleasure in, uh, in, uh, in uh, wanton consumption of hydrocarbon. But I think it's important that we can maintain a way to maintain our standard of living there. And so we have to see what we can do to do that without wrecking the environment. My philosophy is really chemical engineering. And when I do things now with companies is, uh, you know, is either trying to keep company honest or putting the realism uh, in the expectation of investor. And really, I apply what I learned out in chemical engineering. And in a nutshell, I, for me, chemical engineering is few things. Inlet minus uh, outlet plus production minus consumption is equal accumulation. You can say, you know that, you know chemical engineering. But then when you go to industry, you realize that the, the, the same applies to mass and money. And in case of money, if the accumulation is, the derivatives cannot be negative. <laughs> Otherwise, the investor is going to be unhappy. And the corollary third is that, uh, which unfortunately is often missed to the biofuel people, is that Uncle Sam cannot correct for uh, number two. Uh, the, the one more important is that regardless of what uh, uh, many think, uh, especially in the investment community, thermodynamics are not an opinion. And, you know, that, and that's why I said applies also to sand dealers and foggy bottom, because Two places where this is missed is in the investment community and in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And uh, mass balances in malls were not an invention to drive student crazy. So do they work well at that? And uh, you know, we'll be amazed at not using mass balance in malls, how terrible mis financial mistakes are made. And third is uh, the fourth one is really goes back to my, my degree when I was doing graduate work in system engineering is that the world is a complex system, it's nonlinear, dynamic full of lags and feedback loops, so you have to deal with it. But often it makes it difficult to explain. And all models are wrong, some are convenient. So don't, uh, you know, I always laugh when people say that we have a rigorous model of the process. So what, are you using quantum mechanics for everything? So talking about energy is always difficult because as I said, it's fraught with intellectual and semantic risk. You know, the typical question is that, you know, you have a Boeing 747 at uh, 30, 0.13 miles per gallon at 500 miles an hour, and a Prius at 40 miles per gallon at 60 miles an hour. What is more energy efficient? Which one is more energy efficient? And how we define more energy efficiency? Well, the answer is it depends. And as it depends is the typical answer, is weasley answer of engineers when they don't want to really to take a position or they don't know. But actually, in this case, it's true because uh, efficiency is a relative term. And uh, if I measure efficiency in gallons per passenger miles, the, the 747 is actually substantially more energy efficient than the Prius. Obviously, you realize that this is also an extreme position because really we don't care about energy efficiency per se. We care about energy services. And obviously, in the context of energy services, we're not going to use a 747 to commute between work and home. 
but this is important because when you talk about fuel and economics of fuel, my argument has always been that it doesn't matter. We don't buy fuel, we buy mobility. And that's we have to look across the whole spectrum. If we had a car that systematically does 100 miles per gallon, gas at $6 wouldn't look that expensive. And that is what often is missing in a lot of analysis, is looking what the rest of the technology can do to really improve this, uh, the situation in terms of energy services. And I, and, and I will touch on that very briefly when uh, I, will, uh, um, I will talk about uh, not so much cellulosic ethanol. You could infer my opinion about cellulosic ethanol about that. So when we look at the distribution of energy used by source, so what we found, uh, which is very interesting, you know, the evolution between in the, you know, basically in, uh, in roughly 40 years, is that uh, there has been a, quite a shift in a, most of the energy landscape, still a lot of fossil, but, you know, for the, 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 uh, the reliance on petroleum has, dem has diminished quite a bit in every sector other than transportation, where transportation is only king. And what we see in transportation, we see two interesting phenomena. Actually, the reliance on natural gas has decreased, although I think that will change. And I'm a big fan to use natural gas as a fuel. And uh, obviously, there is the renewable. This is pretty much is ethanol in the US. Uh, so ethanol actually makes, a, it makes an impact. But you know, it's still a, a, a small potato compared to the dominant petroleum. And this has to be put in the context of what happens in the evolution of car registration. So there are three things that happen when people become affluent. And this happened in China. They start eating better, so they eat more meat, particularly more meat. They start using more energy because they want to buy a flat screen 50 inch plasma TV. And they want to buy a car all over the world. Uh, and um, well, and all the three things consume energy substantially. So look at what's happening with car ownership. So this, uh, this is the, the diagram that shows car ownership in the United States uh, during the years. Uh, and now other countries uh, country compare. So today in the US, we have about 950 cars every 1,000 people, which is very interesting because obviously that accounts everyone. Uh, infants, kids could not drive, and so on. And you know, I, I raise my hands. We, I, I'm, I'm guilty because I have, you know, we are three, uh, you know, my two kids don't drive, and we have three cars, and one is a, is a toy car that I had since I was single, so, and there's no ever, ever sell, so it's convertible. And, uh, and uh, uh, look at what happens here. This is the evolution in, uh, at the beginning of the century. So if you look at China, China two years ago was where, uh, where uh, the United States in terms of car ownership were in 1913. Today, China is close to where the US were in 1920. So think about what means if the Chinese start buying car, and they are at the rate of Americans. And by the way, right now, that is the single largest uh, uh, market. So, and those trends are, are unstoppable. So, obviously, that uh, says that the demand for fuel is not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, jet fuel is another example. Look at the evolution of air transportation in terms of revenue passenger kilometer or jet fuel consumption in, in a million ton of oil equivalent. As you see, there is a dramatic growth, and where the growth is, is in the alternative market. It's pretty flat in the Western world, but if you look China, Asia, Africa, there is major growth. And, uh, and for aviation, unlike ground transportation, there is no alternative to liquid fuel in the foreseeable future. So to say that sustainable transportation, to my opinion, is not an optional. But as you see, I'm talking about sustainable transportation, not necessarily about biofuel. And, um, and this is a philosophical argument that actually I think uh, where we can criticize the access to cars and so on. In reality, the life of a lot of people are improved. I may look at myself, you know, my grandmother uh, was born and died within uh, 50 miles uh, of, uh, of the same place and never flew by plane. I think uh, the life of our generation was greatly enriched then by, by, by transportation. And I think that is going to be for a lot of other people. So I a world without a form of transportation is going to be a social and economic green one. On the other hand, if we don't have sustainable transportation, we're going to have an environmentally green world. So this is really one of the challenges of this century, bar none, in my opinion. So are the biofuel can rescue us? And uh, you know, I find it interesting that even Ferrari now is getting on uh, this bandwagon. Um, well, if you have heard about biofuel, there is a lot of uh, opinion. You know, there is a lot of uh, an emotional topic. There is a lot of righteous, but often misinformed outrage. So like, you know, the rich American guy stealing the, co 
the corn from uh, the starving African child, uh, the corn, you know, being an SUV, a suburban SUV being filled uh, with, uh, with ethanol, why Uncle Sam stuffed the pockets of the farmer, and of course, uh, the whole issue about palm oil and deforestation and uh, the orangutan. But, but, you know, it's not that on the other side we're much better. As you see, there is a lot of pandering, you know, <laughs> and also a lot of misinformation, you know, like, uh, well, thankfully GM has taken this uh, ad out, but this was a few years back, you know, and they're talking about E85, and they were putting this uh, large truck that uh, on 85 probably does five, seven miles a gallon. But they said, oh, you know. And of course, you know, biodiesel is true. American jobs here and now, but the, real, the reality of biodiesel, however interesting, is that, you know, we, you know, right now we don't really don't have a, uh, a, re a realistic option to do much of, the, of a dent in the, f in the fuel supply. So there is no shortage of definition. I'm not going to try to go through the, all of that. What do you find interest if you do a deep simple search on, on, uh, on biofuel on the web, you'll find a lot of different definitions, some of them contradictory. Uh, what I'm not going to do today is giving, you know, I, we could spend a lot of time doing technology overview and so on, and that would be very interesting. I, I focus only here on technology, a very, you know, uh, to show that really there is no shortage of way to do biofuel. So biofuel issue is not a technology issue is understanding when this technology makes sense in the context of this part of the, the diagram. By the way, this, if you're interested in this topic, this is an excellent paper. I'll do is now a bit told is still one best review of biofuel technology around. Um, everything starts here from, uh, from having some sort of biomass and then from this biomass uh, uh, fractionate and getting compounds. And by the way, notice one, something here. The commercial route are actually relatively simple. And they start typically from starch or oil. And the reason why starch from oil is because actually these are still, despite all the argument we may have on starch and corn, is actually still the cheapest way to get sugar, fermentable sugar, or in the case of oil, a good feedstock that can create alkanes. Because really, nature has already designed those material as uh, uh, energy storage. And so I'll. I really want to focus on some of the characteristics we are looking at in, in some of the feedstock. So why, for instance, vegetable oil is such an interesting feedstock? Well, look at the, at the structure of, of vegetable oil. A typical uh, triglyceride, we have a fatty acid chain with a glycerol backbone and uh, the carboxylic acid group. But you know, I'm a boring chemical engineer that started his career in, uh, in, the, in an oil refinery. And what I see here is I see an alkane already made by nature, ready to go. Better yet than that. Look what happens if you look at the structure, at the carbon number. Fog means uh, biogenic fats, oil, and greases. But the typical crop oil are in this range. And look where diesel fuel is, gasoline and jet fuel. Really, the typical vegetable oil are smacking where you know, middle distillates are. So that's why biodiesel is, such a is actually a good fuel. But better yet uh, is is thinking, uh, you know, with a bit of creativity. And if we know uh, chemical engineering from the oil industry, very simple process, we can make uh, mid real middle distillate. And this, you know, unless you were uh, not reading the news, probably you heard a lot about, uh, about renewable jet fuel and so on. And, you know, it, you know, it's actually very simple to make because what I take, I take the vegetable oil, I go over uh, typically nickel vanadium, nickel or chromium molybdenum catalyst. I, fairly high pressure in hydrogen, but it's a, the stuff is extremely reactive. The reaction takes place. I cleave the backbone and make propane, uh, which is a coproduct. And then here I can either add decarboxylation or hydrodeoxygenation, and then the rest is saturation. And what I get, I get a bunch of, um, a bunch of paraffin. In fact, this is actually a result of an experiment I made. Uh, in collaboration with Aldor Topso, and that is the results. And this was starting from corn oil, and this is what we got out. I mean, uh, you know, interesting one, you know, vegetable oil for some reason that I don't sure why they're all uh, even. So the odd number paraffin means indicates the level of the carboxylation. But you know, from the, from now on, is all uh, you know is going out in the you know is going downhill in terms of uh, being technically easy because. Now we use 70 year old uh, chemical engineering technology. After that, we just have to do some isomerization to control co uh, cold flow or some cracking to control, but the old stuff that, you know, uh, is pretty much part of the domain of technology. But the problem is another one. It's this one. It's a fifth of game. 
Because when you look, for instance, we want to make uh, production cost per gallon of renewable fuel, because I use mature technology for the process, really all the cost is in the feedstock, which is typical of, of, um, of mature te conversion technology. But look, typical cost uh, of crop oils. Current crop oil prices is about six, six cents a pound, 60 cents a pound. If I convert that price in, bar, in, in, uh, in, uh, in the dollars per barrel, I have a cost of dollars per barrel about $170 a barrel. So twice the price, of, uh, the price of oil today. So when I look at this cost structure, this and this cost structure, I can tell you already, I can make it, I can make specs, the plane can fly, but there is no way that I can meet the economics of, uh, uh, of jet fuel today. And there is another problem, which I don't, I didn't put the slide here, but if we consume all the uh, vegetable oil in the world, uh, in the United States at least, uh, so not a single drop of vegetable oil going any longer to make uh, fries at McDonald's and so on, beside, uh, imp beside probably improving collectively our cholesterol level, we would actually uh, uh, substitute only less than 3% of the overall demand of, of middle distillate in the United States. So while these technologies are very interesting uh, and they can be the base, the reality is that all the, really the, the future of biofuel is identified, if we can do biofuel, it's going to be really on the feedstock. Because it says we have technologies and some of this technology actually is based on things we already know how to do it, is in. And then here it comes. Uh, Probably you heard about, about algae. Unless you were under, living under a rock, you probably have heard about algae and all the promise of algae and so on. So here is an interesting, is an interesting uh, table, which I, I took from the web, by the way. I, I don't know where it comes out, but the thing, you know, is it from the internet, so it must be true, isn't it? Um, the interesting is that this actually appears in an NREL report. Uh, and, uh, but NREL in this report quotes Wikipedia. And Wikipedia uh, has it on the table, but, but uh, they use NREL. So, by the way, so I look at this number, and the, up to here they are true. So I said, okay, great. And now you see uh, everyone thinks this, uh, and they say, oh, we can make 15,000 gallons of oil, so, you know, we solve all the problem of the world and so on. So let, let's, you know, so that's where I started saying, okay, let's use some basic chemical engineering to be realistic about that. So first, algae are the safety because they're very good at pigment production. So they're super green. So you get this, this, but you know, even in the best condition, you have less than a gram, gram on a dry basis of biomass per liter. And really you can't go higher. And really uh, you can't apply on, on, uh, on something like microalgae, the same uh, paradigm we use for uh, corn or for, uh, or for soy and so on. First it's diluted. They grow very fast, but however, that is also a problem because it means that they have to be continuously harvested. I mean, they're gonna eventually saturate their environment. Storage is not viable, and also we have to, you know, they're not absent uh, uh, from the problem of having need the nutrients, but the one thing is delivering nutrients in a water medium, one thing is putting a pellets of fertilizer by the root of the plant. So what is a realistic biomass yield? Well, here it is, start with solar radiation. Here, only 45% of solar radiation is photosynthetically active. The maximum theoretically thermodynamic limited conversion of par into biomass is 27%. This is really a thermodynamic limit. Uh, of the photosynthesis. So basically, the maximum theoretical yield of solar radiation biomass to energy is 12%. This is an hard, is an hard number. It's like the Carnot efficiency. Uh, so in real most life, common is actually less than 1%. Highly productive corn hybrids are around 1% and are aiming to 3 to 4. And I says maybe we can get to 5 to 10. I mean, it's amazing what they're doing with genetic engineering. But not without using genetic engineering, and which obviously has a lot of other problems, and we are not there. You know, for comparison, you know, we are talking about, people already think about they can get to 10 to 15% with photovoltaic. But, you know, if you get, uh, assuming that, uh, you know, we can get some very good numbers, those are the productivity of biomass, uh, of algal biomass in tons per acre per year. And, you know, later we're going to look at what this mean, but I would like already to notice that something when, you know, but you have to think in terms of systems. Where is the high productivity is? What does it spell for a, a crop that requires a lot of water? So now you start seeing the problem. Yeah, it's great. I'll put something in the middle of the, uh, the New Mexico desert because I have a lot of sun. And what I do? Where I find the water. So, 
We'll talk a bit about more in detail about that, but for instance, assume that water is not a problem. So based on the, on the best US potential, we have 140 tons per acre when you translate those tonnage in, uh, in uh, per acre. So basically means 74 tons per acre of carbon based on this example of an algal biomass composition. You know, uh, that means 200, 271 tons per acre of CO2. That is not an insignificant amount of CO2. We need actually to put CO2 in the water. The idea that we can create a large amount of algae just by sucking up uh, atmospheric CO2 at uh, 300 ppm is, well, okay, we are engineers. We can say it's as nine to the best. Uh, but look at this other thing here. You think corn is bad? You're going to, based on this amount of night, and this is based purely a molar bus balance. I told you that moles are important. Uh, you, requ you require 1.2 tons per acre of nitrogen or 24 tons per acre of urea and 380 kilograms of per acre of phosphorus or 1.8 tons per acre of, of ammonium phosphate. And granted, if you really want to be a bit uh, 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 finessing here, you should say that if you do this, you need to re slightly reduce this. Maybe it's 22 tons because obviously you cannot provide some nitrogen there. But then I was studying saying that the amount of fertilizer needed is actually much worse than corn. And by the way, there is a very, uh, the algae actually, there is a read ratio that says that uh, the, uh, that gives us some very, which is read is the name of, uh, of an American biologist that in the 30s, 30s made a big survey of algae species and found that basically the carbon nitrogen ratio on a weight basis of most algae is pretty constant. And so pretty much every algae is between eight and a half to six and a half percent nitrogen on a dry basis and between two and a half and 0.5 phosphorus. So those numbers are, you know, you can tell that, oh, I'm going to get uh, some genetic engineering algae that's going to be, no, those are really pretty much hardcore written. So, so you see some of the problem that we have. But also, let's look at productivity and control the lab conditions. So this actually is a, uh, comes from a work done at the professor Mario Levich at the University of Florence. And we have looked at se several types of microalgae and the biomass productivity milligrams per liter per day. And by the way, uh, I'm, you know, again, I'm, here I put the, the, my chemical engineering out from all refined. I get also uncomfortable when I talk about milligrams. You know, you know, this is okay for biologists, but for a chemical engineer, milligrams is not a unit we use. <laughs> uh, it's just, so what? Uh, it's a rounding error. And uh, lipid content is a percentage of biomass and lipid productivity. So you see it's interesting. There is a trade-off between, uh, between uh, biomass productivity often and, and yield pro and lipids productivity. So I'm interested in lipids. This is not the best biomass. And by the way, this also shows a problem that we have when people think about, com you know, like we can use a bio uh, algae to scavenge phosphorus in wastewater treatment plant. Well, if you want to really maximizing phosphorus scavenging, then you go here, but you're not going to make biodiesel. You make a lot of other interesting stuff, but this is an excursion. So, I c you know, we take some of these best uh, algae uh, that have the best compromise between biome, it is nanochloropsis actually is the most interesting species, best compromise between biomass yield and lipid yields. And let's look at the other thing. So how this translate in oil productivity per acre? So I say 86 milligrams per liter per day productivity in oil. You know, algae really grow in the smaller layer where light can penetrate around 10 centimeter depth. So having, you know, a big deep pond doesn't do anything. Uh, so roughly 86 grams per meter square day of oil. Biomass, we have 28 grams per meter square meter per day. So over a year, that translates into oil production, 28,000 liters per, per, sorry, not per hectare per year. And so 3,000 gallons per hectare per year. Well, that is actually some already the best conditions. So as you see, is it, you know, this number is absolutely baloney. I mean, is, you know, realistically, you know, people might do 500 to, you know, maybe we can get to 5,000 with some genetic engineering, but the 15,000 is actually ludicrous. And in fact, I can tell you already that it's totally ludicrous because if you do the thermodynamic, I'll save you this, or as my professor used to say, I leave to the reader the easy exercise. Uh, you, you, you require a thermodynamic efficiency only in, only in oil production well above, uh, well above, uh, uh, well above uh, eight or 9%, which you know, is, is unheard of. Um, so it's still good. Uh, because, you know, palm oil is the best, and so we talk about at least a small order or even an order of magnitude better. But how we do it? Because, again, as engineers, we start thinking, okay, how are we going to do that to get out, you know, this stuff from the soup, the soup they are? 
Well, you look at the basic flow diagram microalgae processing, you cult cultivate, you have to have a, you know, less than 1% rice solid, primary concentration, secondary concentration. Yeah, guess what? When you get a 15, 20% dry solid, you have a material, which you can do that by centrifugation, by the way, that it looks like toothpaste. It smells like fish, because actually the fish smell like algae, not the other way around. But uh, um, yeah, it's the, it's, the it's the algal oil, actually smells like fish. So. And, um, but you know, it's actually not any longer visible moisture because now it's all intracellular water. And you already understand where things become complicated because now it's pretty tough to remove that water. So I have to do some dewatering, get into at least 10% oil content, which at which time I can do some realistic extraction. So, you know, trying to get some sense of the economics. And, and the way I do it, because I'm, I mean, like back of the envelope calculation and visualize things, it says, well, okay, we do it with water. Everyone is familiar with an Olympic, uh, regulation Olympic swimming pool. So if I use that as a paradigm, how much algae I can produce, how much oil? So just to give you an idea, it's 50 meters by 25 meters by 2 meter regulation. So two and a half million liters, roughly 660,000 gallons. Assume that we get the same water. As I said, the algae grow only in, in the first 10 centimeters, more or less. So let's spread that water over, over a pond, which is what the DOE prescribed for growing algae, which is basically a kind of, a, you know, as I said, the name. A oval type of pond with a very shallow that water circulate with a paddle wheel that move around. So about 50 centimeters deep. So we have 1.7 acres. Let's do good but not impossible productivity value. 20 grams per day and 30% lipids. By the way, no algae company in the world has yet to achieve this consistently outside the lab. Uh, but at least we know that in the lab. So assume that we manage to do. That means 100 kilograms of biomass per day, 33 liters of oil per day, 2,500 2, gallons per acre of oil yield. That is, looks pretty good until you think that in order to produce 8.7 gallons of oil, I need to process. So what does it mean? Well, again, I, you know, I'm a simple-minded engineer. I like back of the envelope calculation. And my philosophy is that if it doesn't work back of the envelope, I, I, it doesn't work uh, with more sophisticated models. So pumping cost, uh, this is the get the parry. You get a cost for pumping, assuming seven cents a kilowatt hour. Incidentally, it probably in California would be expensive. Assume that at least 10 feet head. Now, if you want to do this over a lot of acres, it's going to be much more. But now, yeah. so you get $1.8 a day or 20 cents of, of, of gallon of oil in net, in net of capital cost. I ignore the primary concentration because I'm in a good mood. Secondary uh, concentration, I go from 1,300 to 1,500 gallons per day, which basically brings me to about 20% dry solid, which is as much I can go without evaporation, without um, uh, breaking the cell wall. Uh, again, if you look at this, might require a one third to two thirds HP centrifuge. Again, I save you the calculation of uh, the per recalculation, but this pretty much is give you about seven cents uh, in power, netto capital cost again. The watering, well, you know, uh, 6% oil content, uh, remove enough water to be at 10%. Well, I need probably to use, uh, now I have to use energy. Uh, you know, I assume that I have a um, magic evaporator that works at 100% uh, at efficiency. Uh, I need so many BTU per day, $4 a million BTU. I get 26 cents per gallon. So here it is. Netto capital cost and so on, I have already spent 50 cents a gallon of oil and I'm not extracted the oil yet. And uh, I don't have a considered capitalization. But the worst part is this. I have used already 256 clower a day for an energy yield of 370 kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hour a day. So I already have two thirds of, uh, of oil energy already lost. I really, I don't need to spend that much more time to do sophisticated calculation to do that this doesn't work. But um, that is what. Uh, Uncle Sam, nonetheless, is interested in that. So my friends, uh, John Sheehan, that at the time was an NREL and Ben Wu at Sandia National Lab, have done a really detailed model that uh, I, 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 they let me use. And so this, in, you know, using $2,006, we calculated that uh, uh, the net cost of algal oil in this type of pond system using CO2 from flue gas, dedicated algae pond, primary the water, belt filter, secondary the water centrifuge, drying natural gas, and extensive salt extraction. The algal oil will cost $14 a gallon, which I can live with it if I'm going to sell it algal oil as an omega-3 fatty acid for, uh, to, as, a, as a supplement for a, a baby formula or for nutraceuticals. 
but not for fuel. And of course, people that are already, are already doing that, in fact, there is a company in California, Airtrise Nutri Nutritional, close to the Mexican border that already does that and does a corner of the market. So there is really no point unless we think differently. But what uh, the argument is, this is not so much to slam algae. I think algae has some value because to work in algae, but just uh, uh, the expectation that uh, you, we can basically have a silver bullet that uh, we can come up with some new solution very quickly. And by the way, if we go back to the example before where you see the corner in New Mexico, when you translate, uh, you're going to see, you're going to see, and you can search on the web because you're going to find some of the companies that they do this claim that say, oh, we can get this out of New Mexico uh, and we're going to make as enough oil to provide all the diesel in the United States uh, in, the, in an area, maybe the base of a county in New Mexico. Well, the problem is that, is that, yes, we can do that in terms of solar radiation, maybe, but <laughs> they will need all the CO2 from California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas to, to do that as, uh, as well. <laughs> So, and this goes back to my another question, which is really looking at this in terms of system, the biomass dilemma, uh, which, uh, you know, I also call the, uh, you know, here maybe I can do it, but, you know, I, I, the first time I presented this problem was at a cellulosic ethanol conference, and I stopped being invited to cellulosic ethanol conference, which was a bummer, but, but okay. Uh, so here I have, so I can get this biomass, and I says I can do liquid fuel, cellulosic ethanol, or uh, power. I mean, I can do also other liquid fuels, but let's assume cellulosic ethanol because there is a lot of interest in the product. So here are the, my thing, uh, biomass, I can go to the bio, biochemical conversion, I go to liquid fuel, so I go to car, light duty vehicles, and that's gonna blend with oil. Somewhere, you know, there's gonna be a blend with oil system. Or, boring, old style technology, I can burn the biomass, uh, and I make power, I go to the grid, and I, you know, this my substitute or, or blend with power made from coal and go to the user. So how does, uh, so here a situation. So one ton of, uh, one dry ton of biomass, $80 a ton, 68,000 megajoule. Go chemical conversion, uh, assuming some of the best number around, we can make about 70 gallons of ethanol, 9,900, close to 10,000 megajoule, $3 a gallon, I make 210. $210 and I have 60% conversion efficiency. That is the equivalent of 50, uh, 50 uh, gallons of gasoline equivalent and 686 uh, kilograms of CO2 displaced. So it looks good. Well, look about, uh, about uh, p power, you know, everything, you know, if uh, power, uh, yeah, I can I have a lower efficiency if I do by combustion. Uh, I, pro you know, I produce actually less energy and I make less money. Uh, the only advantage I have is that I replace a lot of carbon, displace a lot of carbon, but nobody, nobody cares about it right now. And, um, and so really, I mean, I'm a venture capitalist. I look at this and catching, that is the way to do. But unfortunately, it's because we don't think in terms of system. Of course, we can, the fuel is only a component of a transportation system. Uh, we have, uh, we are, you know, this is Chevy Volt, this is the uh, Leaf, this is the, the new Tesla, com and this is if everything else fails, if there is always that we know that is going to be available. Well, what happens now if I put the power in this direction? So I use one of these views, and I start talking about uh, consider the drivetrain efficiency and the energy service efficiency. So the amount of miles that I'm actually uh, I actually can, or the amount of energy that I use for actual transportation when used, when using as a reference, the amount of energy was in my original feedstock. Well, look what happens here. The power, be, uh, the first uh, drivetrain efficiency of an electric car is substantially higher. So in fact, I deliver while the drivetrain efficiency of a combustion engine is pretty poor. So uh, suddenly I deliver to my end user as an actual usable energy, much more. The result is that I have 25% energy service efficiency of starting from here versus 11% uh, because the drivetrain efficiency. And, uh, and also, because of this difference in efficiency they, and this fact that this is actually cheaper, actually my cost per megajoule is substantially cheaper. So when I look suddenly, I've had this line, this system doesn't look that good. And if I should actually put a carbon cost, I look why this become particularly interesting because actually the impact of cost of CO2 would be such that really we would displace coal 
with biomass much more easily than displaced gasoline. So again, obviously this would be a longer analysis that by itself can take the whole discussion, but it gives us an idea why when we look at biofuel, we have to think in terms of the system. Does it mean that ethanol doesn't make any sense? Absolutely not. It means that if we just think that uh, we look at this problem only from a point of view, well, today we use under 40, uh, 14, uh, uh, you know, under 40 billion gallons of gasoline per, uh, uh, per year. And, you know, unless we find uh, another alternative source, uh, we are going to be in trouble. So and by the year 2030, we need 60 billion gallons of ethanol. And uh, we might, you know, we, we are approaching the problem very, in a very wrong fashion. And by the way, situation doesn't change that much if you use advanced, advanced biofuel. Because uh, look, uh, this is stoichiometry, so ethanol. Look, you know, a kilogram of good clothes can give us ethanol, two moles of ethanol. I told you about the moles again. And that means that we get basically, you know, 51% uh, uh, weight yield. So we get out of, 40, out of kilogram of glucose, we get 14.72 megajoules or 0.64 liters of, um, of ethanol. But look at what happens with butanol that gets a lot of advertisement as advanced fuel. Actually, butanol has a worse energy efficiency, and I get less of it. And although the fuel has higher energy value, I energy content because I let uh, uh, less of it actually I get less uh, energy in my fuel so the only way I can justify butanol over ethanol if I can capture some extra value which maybe in the butanol case might be true on uh, uh, because you know it doesn't blend as easily with water and can be shipped in the pipeline but unfortunately butanol also kills my ethanol economics because I can't sell the the, the co-products if I do normal octane, it gets worse. If I go ethyl benzene, it gets uh, even, uh, you know, and uh, is not any better. And by the way, these are not random examples. Right now, there are heavily funded startups, some of which have already gone public, that do these routes. So we have really to rethink the assumption, not only where we use the, uh, where we use the, the, in the way we use the fuel, but also in the way we design the fuel system. And the problem is that oil was, uh, has made us think in a totally different fashion. It's an extremely uh, concentrated energy force, form, liquid, we can ship it over long distance, and then we can get this massive, massive uh, production facility where we have very good economy of scale. But when you look at, at biofuel, things change. And there is a reason why this is the maximum size of an ethanol plant because we have to pick up stuff here. And really, we're going to be limited by the ability to call uh, the radius where the corn can be collected. This is about 100 million gallon. Um, so let me give you an idea. Is that, OK, well, how much energy we have in a barrel oil? 6.1 gigajoule. So rem remember this chart? So uh, we have uh, basically, if we look at this productivity, assuming this very good value, which, you know, here is really the maximum that are possible. We talk about something between 500 barrels of oil equivalent per, uh, per acre, per hectare, sorry, uh, to 1,500. This is really as good as it gets. It's not going to get any better than that, assuming that, you know, just based on, on, on thermodynamics. And, uh, and again, we are not able today to make those numbers, but at least are not thermodynamically impossible. But let's do an example what this really that means. So you, Corn stover is what is left on the ground after uh, the corn has been harvested. So uh, in, the, in the corn belt, we have, on a dry basis, we have about 10 tons per acre, per acre of this stuff. And you know, this is based on uh, 50, under, 150 bushel per acre of corn, where a bushel is 56 pounds, 50% uh, moisture. So theoretical energy availability, we have 8,000, uh, uh, oh, sorry, there's a, uh, a left tele, but BT, uh, yeah, this, uh, misspell here, BTU, uh, uh, BTU per pound on a dry basis, and that corresponds to about 30 barrels of oil equivalent. And this is really already pretty idealized because first, biomass is going to be 50 to 30 percent moisture. So this number per ton is based on a, on a dry basis. So you actually have to move more stuff. And if you leave it on the ground too long, I mean, uh, you know, this stuff is going to pick up moisture pretty quickly. Also, maximum 50 percent. Uh, is available to preserve soil health. I mean, you need to leave some of this stuff on the ground for one, because it contains a lot of carbon and other nutrients that need to return to the, to the ground for, to provide nutrients. But secondly, also to provide, uh, to, provide uh, to prevent soil ero uh, erosion of the topsoil. And, so, and so we can basically get half of it. And the, and the extremely high 
uh, bulk density. So basically, we are talking about uh, 30, 15 barrels of oil equivalent per acre. Now, before I had this picture of the stripper wells, of those uh, jack pumps, uh, in the US, a typical jack pump uh, or a typical stripper well produces two to three barrels per day, uh, per, uh, of oil per day, which is not a lot in the normal scheme, but looking over a year, you produce 600 to 1,000 barrels of oil, while here, in a year, I get 15 barrels. And I have to slave around to pick it up while uh, in the jacket it comes out of a three-inch pipe, ready to go. So which is the path to follow? As I said, sustainable transportation should be addressed by a comprehensive point of view. Technology advances need to be ac evaluated across the whole supply chain. A new molecule might be great in the lab, but if I don't look in the context of the supply chain, I might still do some terrible mistakes. But, so new feedstock, new molecules, but new drivetrain, a new transportation option. And, we, and by reducing liquid consumption, we also met blending level over level volumes. But the other thing is societal factors are important. Well, we are engineers. We don't do things in societal factors. But we do. Food versus fuel is important. I mean, I don't want to trivialize, and there is a lot of crap out there about food versus fuel. But it's a real, it's a real issue. But actually, it's not food versus fuel. Much more subtle is water and land disposition. Because at the end of the day, if I want biomass, I want to have, I need water resources and I need good land. The guys that come up and says, I use Jatropha because, you know, Jatropha is, uh, is a non food crop. But, you know, Jatropha is a, and grows in the desert. Ah, correction, Try, uh, survives in the desert. If you want to have the yield this guy claims, you need fertilizer, you need water, even on Jatropha. And so we have solved nothing. I mean, just the fact we don't eat the stuff, we displace arable land. The actual carbon, uh, uh, carbon footprint and looking really at, you know, really how we can decarbonize the economy and how we approach honestly a life cycle analysis. But to me, the two, the two most important things are here. One, you know, I strike down energy independence because I, think I get also nervous when I think about energy independence because I think the only way that, if you are honest, intellectually honest, the only way that we can do energy independence is, is driving less. Uh, a country like the U.S. cannot do, but we can do energy diversification. And that goes uh, issue of transportation policy, public versus private, and urban development. You know, what are the, our attitude to personal freedom in movement and work attitude and so on. So it's a much longer discussion. If we keep this in mind, I think we have pathways because, again, we cannot win on the supply side alone. And I believe that uh, uh, we have to focus on transportation fuel in the area where electrons cannot be an alternative. So there's going to be a big challenge to find alternative to aviation fuel and also the uh, alter, uh, alternative for, for fuel, or at least component of that, of that pi part of, uh, of, of fuel that um, um, for uh, uh, heavy duty transportation. Now, this is a simplified version of uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, diagram before. And as you see, there is companies working in all these uh, areas. And, uh, Incidentally, I should update that because that has gone bust and that has gone bust. And, but, and I, 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 I go on record here, so I, can, I back $10, $10 that this is going to go bust too within, within, within 24 months. <laughs> and remind me in 24 months, I'm going to send the 10 bucks. And um, uh, so there are a lot of companies here, and a lot are, are heavily funded by VCs, some have gone public and so on. But the dilemma we have working with fuel and working with energy is that we are working with the most uh, basic commodity that deal. And unfortunately, a lot of these companies, we have a dilemma when we try to get uh, investment money. Because uh, if you remember the paradigm from uh, Peter Drucker is that companies are two types of companies. Companies that thrive on product differentiation, that technology driven and have high margin. Um, it's not, you know, Apple. But when you go into fuel, you always talk about operational efficiency, commodity driven and high volume. My et if I make ethanol, my ethanol is the same whether I use the most sophisticated genetic engineering for a bug or I have uh, a 50-year-old copper steel in Brazil. And the consumer doesn't care. And that is where the dilemma for this company are because a lot of this, a lot, because we are looking at point solution, we don't know how economically we're going to agree from a technology-driven model to a commodity-driven model. And part of that, uh, it can be only bridged if we enter in this world, we start entering more in a collaborative environment, which incidentally, the IT world has realized. So you get an iPhone and there are about 300 cross-licensing agreement in this product. But if you look at the biofuel arena, you have all these companies that are trying to do the complete supply chain. 
and uh, you know, and uh, and obviously it's not going to work. So I conclude this uh, probably having created more questions that uh, I've answered. And I said, obviously, it could be strange because, says, you know, I'm talking about biofuel. I work in biofuel, and never said very few positive things you might think about biofuel. In reality, it's not that I don't say positive things about biofuel, but I want to put realism in the assessment of the options. We are at the very beginning of a long journey where every single solution needs to be evaluated correctly. But also, we have to be intellectually honest of what we can do. So today, I'm working, I was just saying to some of you earlier today, I'm working on a project where we are building, we're going to build small biodiesel plants. And by the way, normally, I'm not a fan of biodiesel per se. Uh, in uh, uh, to provide to make small community uh, plants uh, in uh, in uh, rural Colombia, 500 liters per day. Uh, well, I think that is a great solution. It's not going to change the world, but it's going to change those villages quite substantially because today the, the the Colombian government is actually subsidizing diesel to provide fuel to the farmers, and we we know in a lot of these villages we have the fi free, uh, cheap feedstock coming from their agricultural production. And now we can make those villages energy self-sufficient on the agricultural side. And by doing that, actually, we're going to remove this number one impact on the food cost. We're not going to change the world, but we're going to change uh, a village in Colombia. And I think that is a worthwhile thing. And I think that is how the energy will, that will, uh, will move in the future. We're going to go to the mainframe model to more decentralized model. A lot of challenges on doing that uh, for obvious reasons. But I think you know, we're at the beginning of a major transformation. So I believe biofuels can play a role, but we have to be realistic about the limitation, which are part of a larger system. And thank you, and I hope that uh, Yeah, the, the, we go there, yeah. That can change. I mean, and I have to say that I'm working with a co actually I have one of my thing. I have a co-founder of a company that uh, we have an RPA project in immobilizing cyanobacteria. So I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm. I didn't have the space to the data. I mean, that's part of the of that type of new approach that we have to look at. But even then, there are some challenges. By the way, Greg Venter, I think, made a, ruffled quite a few feathers at Exxon recently because he went public and says, unless we do totally synthetic biology, these things will never work. And, uh, and his CTO was at the algal biomass meeting a month ago in Minneapolis and said exactly the same. And the Exxon people were sort of trying to calm, da calm them down. Um, th there are still some problems there also because still some of the dilution issues are, are still there. Um, for instance, uh, when you some of these, some of these uh, algae, my, like the one that on which uh, some of the uh, like synthetic genomics is working right now, and that's why actually the comment of, uh, the comment of, um, uh, the comment by uh, uh, by Venter uh, secrete, but there's still a lot of dilution in the in the process. So really, what you have is a sheen of oil, which is still pretty expensive to remove. It's not that we have a, a huge amount of oil and we can uh, use a, a simple phase separation. So now there is a lot of work to improve uh, the water to organic ratio, or to look at the ways, and that can be very interesting, to contain the algae and contain the water phase. So for instance, you're familiar about, you might heard about algae and all that once basically contain the algae within an hydrophobic membrane. So basically the things go through and then can be separated differently. Uh, I'm, we are working on, a, my, one of the companies we're working, we're working on a concept to immobilize in the algae on a surface. So those things will work, are better and, and we can tell you why. Um, but, and, but we're still a long way because of, m mostly because of productivity issues still. And, uh, and the fact that uh, right now, what uh, in this environment, what is really the killer is actually the longevity of the algae. 
so I, when I talk about algae, uh, I, to me, my, the scope was to show that the simple-minded approach uh, doesn't work. We have to really to think uh, a fundamental changes in the way we do it. But the fundamental changes are not one guaranteed and not, uh, they're not going to happen overnight. I mean, I can tell you one other example is that, uh, are you familiar with Solazyme? Solazyme is a great company. I know them very well. I think they have a fabulous technology. But, big but, is uh, they grow algae as a dark fermentation system. And they, sec and, uh, and they mostly, uh, and so their yields are pretty good. So they have about 300 grams per liter of algae, uh, of which 80% is oil. And the extraction actually relatively simple for them because it's such high concentration. But, and that is the but, they are using sugar as a feedstock. Do the stoichiometry, basically when they say the Air Force uh, is flying jets with their stuff, apart the cost, they might as well uh, run on ethanol. And, uh, and the problem is that sugar from biomass today are, not, are more expensive because it's difficult to, difficult to separate and to cl clean. So again, there is a lot of interesting work, uh, but again, we are not absent of this consideration. So again, there was not enough time to enter it. I don't want to focus on algae. I want to focus most on looking at the system and trying to have this top-down approach. But I agree with you. If algae will succeed, that is the way. By the way, um, Solazyme, I think, will also succeed. Maybe we'll never make a drop of fuel, but they're going to make some a very valuable uh, specialty. They already have reduced the price potentially of some uh, uh, high-end omega-3 fatty acids. The problem is that uh, you don't, at right now, you don't get VC money if you say, I'm going to make a big, two, a very profitable $200 million company. And that is really the challenge. So often a lot of companies stretch the, what, the, what they can say because they say, oh, I need to reach that billion dollar mark of potentiality. Otherwise, the guys in Sandy Hill Road will not listen to you. Yeah. And then they replace the steam motor with the electric motor, and the electric motors are terrible on the AC. And somebody had a bright idea to put a little electric motor in every school, and, and that's what made the huge difference. So why do we need to have this suggestion? I mean, I do gardening, I produce a lot of uh, stuff I can get rid of, but why can't I have something very small in my garage? You know, I go back to a story that I read about the story of electrification in the United States. So when Thomas Edison was the first to put uh, power plants, uh, uh, he was basically dreaming of a world where each building would have his own power generator and was AC. Uh, sorry, was uh, DC. Uh, then uh, Tesla says, well, I can, I can make DC and we can transport uh, DC over, uh, over long uh, distance uh, better. And uh, another engineer figured out that he could build uh, this uh, DC generator very uh, inexpensively, but most important, and that other engineer was a guy named Westinghouse. And then they convinced, the, and then where the money guy always played, that there was more money to be made in a larger plant. And the guy was JP Morgan. And so they basically start building big plants and they persuade the world that this was the way to go. And so poor Thomas Edison, you know, there's actually, there's a book about this whole story, was trying to persuade the world that guys, uh, this, uh, AC is very dangerous, so he made the public demonstration by was getting two pigs, and one was putting a, a uh, DC, and the pig was happy, and AC, and the pig was fulminated dead. But you know, the point is that uh, there was actually more money to be made, and and in this centralized system. And at the time, I can understand that. But the problem is that we have created basic, and that's on oil was easy to do that because the economy of scale would allow decentralization. I think uh, when we look at uh, the future of energy, we really have to look at localization of the solution. Because again, some of this feedstock play makes sense. I mean, uh, does it make sense to use stover? Probably does. I mean, but not to build a hundred, you know, a 10,000 bar or 50,000 barrels per day plant making cellulosic ethanol, but maybe to use it for local energy uh, electrification and so on. So we're going to completely change. The problem is that today we don't have neither the regulatory environment nor the, uh, nor the um, financial environment to support that type of enterprise. 
that is a big, big obstacle. Why we don't do more cogeneration in the United States? I mean, this is b boggles the mind. Why we don't do more cogeneration? I was, uh, you know, I, I was working with my colleagues when I was at Cargill, and I was wondering why we don't put, we consume all this natural gas? Uh, why don't we put uh, a small frame uh, aeroderivative G uh, eng uh, um, gen gen you know, turbine? In burn the gas, generate electricity. We could export a couple, five or six megawatt of power, and we have enough, uh, enough, uh, uh, enough uh, uh, high quality waste heat coming from the turbine to provide basically 8% of our power uh, steam need, or 70%, and then we just need some extra gas for peak shaving. Well, the reason is that uh, try to negotiate uh, uh, getting a utility to get one agreement is almost impossible. It's very tough to work with the utilities. So they don't, they don't, they have a, a mandatory, ma they need to buy the power, but they're gonna power, the, they're gonna buy the power from you a fuel replacement cost, which in Midwest means two cents a kilowatt hour because it's the fuel replacement cost of the, of the, of the coal. So again, compare that, uh, uh, the situation with the Netherlands where fundamentally you can trade, the, you know, you, you have a much freer environment in which the utilities have to buy a market price. And suddenly in our plant in the Netherlands in Cargill, we had exactly the same system. So I think, you know, again, I don't say that the government should subsidize, but actually should help by regulatory environment. And today is skewed towards uh, decentralized solutions. Thank you.